Six o'clock came and went, and my friends had not arrived. At seven, they had still not been seen, and so I took my treasured tab of orange sunshine and settled down to wait. Ten minutes later, they arrived. I could already feel myself going and so gestured to the two piles of datura seeds that I had prepared. They took them downstairs to my room and ground them in a mortar and pestle before washing them down with some tea. By the time they had returned to the roof and gotten comfortably settled, I was surging through mental space. We sat, and hours seemed to pass. When they seated themselves, I had been too distant to be aware of what was going on. She was seated directly across from me, and he further back to one side and in the shadow. He played his flute. I passed the pipe, and the hours passed. The moon rose high in the sky and full. I fell into long, hallucinatory reveries that each lasted many minutes. When I emerged from a particularly long spell of visions, I found that my friend had stopped playing and gone away, leaving me with his lady. I had promised them both that I would let them try some DMT during the evening. My glass pipe and tiny stash of waxy orange DMT were right before me. Slowly and with the fluid movements of a dream, I filled the pipe and offered it to her. The stars, hard and unglittering, stared down from a mighty distance on all of this. She took the pipe and took two deep inhalations, <laughs> sufficient for a person so frail. Then the pipe was returned to me, and I followed her into it with four huge inhalations, the fourth of which I held on to until I had broken through. For me, it was an enormous amount of DMT, and I immediately felt the sense of entering a high vacuum. There was a high-pitched whine and the sound of cellophane ripping as I was transformed into the radio intellect that is a human being in DMT ecstasy. I was surrounded by the chattering elf machines and the more than Arabian vaulted spaces that would shame a Bibiena. Manifestations of a power both alien and bizarrely beautiful raging around me. At the point where I would normally have expected the visions to fade, the pre-treatment with LSD synergized the situation to a higher level. With the translinguistic glossolalia of the DMT elf machines howling in my ears, I suddenly found myself flying hundreds of miles above the earth and in the company of silvery discs Several, I could not tell how many. I looked down and realized that I was moving south, apparently in Earth orbit, over Soviet Siberia. Ahead of me I could see the great plain of Shang and the mass of the Himalayas rising up in front of the red-yellow waste of India. The sun would rise in about two hours. In a series of telescoping leaps, I went from orbit to a point where I could specifically pick out the round valley that is the Kathmandu Valley. Then, in the next leap, the valley filled my field of vision. 
I seemed to be approaching it in ground level at great speed. I could see the Hindu temple and the houses of Kathmandu, the temple of Svayambhunath to the west of the city, and the stupa at Bodhanath gleaming white a few miles to the east. Then Bodhanath was a mandala of houses and circular streets filling my vision, and among the several hundred rooftops, I found my own. The next moment I slammed into my body and was refocused on the rooftop and the woman in front of me. Incongruously, she had come to the event wearing a silver satin full-length evening dress, an heirloom, the sort of thing one would have found in an antique clothing store in Notting Hill Gate. I fell forward and thought that my hand was covered with some cool white liquid. It was the fabric of the dress. To that moment, neither of us had thought of the other as a lover. Our relationship had functioned on a quite different level. Suddenly, all the normal sets of relations were obviated. We both reached out toward the other, and the impression I had was distinctly that of passing through her, of physically <coughs> reaching beyond her. She pulled her dress over her head in a single gesture. I did the same with my shirt, which ripped to pieces in my hands as I took it off over my head. I heard buttons fly, and I heard my glasses land somewhere and shatter. Then we made love, or rather we had an experience that vaguely related to making love, but was a thing unto itself. We were both howling and singing in the glossolalia of DMT rolling over the ground with everything awash and crawling geometric hallucinations. She was transformed. Words exist to describe what she became. Pure anima, Kali, Lucathea, something erotic but not human, something addressed to the species and not to the individual, glittering with the possibility of cannibalism, madness, space, and extinction. She seemed on the edge of devouring me. Reality was shattered. This kind of fucking must go on at the very limit of what is possible. Everything had been transformed into orgasm and visible chattering oceans of elf language. Then I saw that where our bodies were glued together was flowing out of her cunt over me, over the floor of the roof, flowing everywhere with some sort of obsidian liquid, something dark and glittering with color and lights within it. After the DMT flash, after the many orgasms with the transformed woman become myth and archetype, after all of this, this new thing shocked me to the core. What was it and what was going on? I looked at it, I looked right into it, and it was the surface of my own mind reflected in front of me. Translinguistic matter, the living opalescent excrescences of the abyss of hyperspace. Something generated by the sex act performed under such crazy conditions. I looked into it again and saw now a scene. The Lama who taught me Tibetan, who should be asleep a mile away. In the fluid I saw him, in the company of a monk I had never seen. They were looking into a mirrored plate. Then I realized that they were watching me. I could not understand it. I looked away from the fluid, looked away from my companion whom I could not look at. Her aura of strangeness was so intense. Then I realized that we had been singing and yodeling and uttering wild orgasmic howls for what must have been several minutes. It meant everyone in Bodenoff must be awake and about to open their doors and windows and demand to know what was going on and what was going on. Good God! <laughs> Thank you.
the thought of discovery sobered me enough to realize that we must get away from this exposed situation, both of us completely naked and the scene around us one of total unexplainable chaos. She was lying down, unable to get up, and so I picked her up and made my way down the narrow staircase, past the grain storage bins, and into my room. All the time I remember saying over and over to her and to myself, I am a human being, I am a human being. I was no longer sure. We waited in my room many minutes. Slowly it dawned that by some miracle no less strange than everything else that had gone on, no one was awake demanding to know what was occurring. No one seemed even to have heard. To calm us, I made tea, and as I did this, I had a chance to assess my companion's state of mind. She seemed quite delirious, quite unable to discuss with me what had gone on only a few moments before on the roof. It is an effect typical of Datura that whatever experiences one has, they are very difficult, usually impossible to recollect later. It seemed that though what had gone on had involved the most intimate of acts between two people, nevertheless I had been the only witness who could remember anything at all of what had happened. Pondering all of this, I crept back to the roof and collected my glasses. Incredibly, they were unbroken, although I had distinctly heard them break. With my glasses and our clothes, I returned to my room where my companion was sleeping. I smoked a little hashish and then climbed into the mosquito net and lay down beside her. In spite of all the excitement and the stimulation of my system, I went immediately to sleep. I have no idea how long I slept. When I awoke, it was with a start and from a deep slumber. It was still dark and there was no sign of my friend. I felt a stab of alarm. If she was delirious, then it was very bad for her to be wandering alone around the village at night. I jumped up and threw on my jalaba and began to search, not on the roof, not near the grain storage. I found her on the ground level of the building. She was sitting on the earth floor, staring at her reflection in the gas tank of a motorcycle that belonged to the miller's son-in-law. She was still disoriented in the way that is typical hallucinating persons present, mistaking one person for another. Are you my tailor? She asked me several times as I led her back to my room. When we were both once again upstairs in my quarters, I took off my jalava, and we both discovered that I was wearing what she delicately described as my knickers. They were quite too small on me, and neither of us knew how they had come to be on me. It was the capstone of an amazing evening, and I roared with laughter. I returned her knickers to her, and we went to bed, puzzled, reassured, exhausted, and amused. As this experience passed behind us, the girl and I became even closer friends, we never made love again. It was not really the relationship that suited us. She remembered nothing of the events on the roof. About a week after all this was history, I told her my impression of what had happened. She was amazed but accepting. I did not know what had happened. I christened the obsidian fluid we had generated love, L-U-V, something more than love, something less than love, perhaps not love at all, but some kind of unplumbed potential human experience very little is known about. It was this incident which rekindled my interest in the violet fluids which ayahuasca shamans are said to generate on the surface of their skins and use to divine and cure. Whenever I tell this story, it is the phenomenon of the liquid that I stress. That was what I accentuated to assure Dennis that night at La Chirera. I did not tell the absurd part about waking up wearing someone else's underwear. It was damn embarrassing and absurd and contributed nothing to the story. At that time, I had never told anyone that part of the incident. It was a personal memory. I mention this because that absurd incident was later to be the focus of an instance of telepathy that was the most convincing that I have ever witnessed. <laughs> Thank you for the present and 
she said, I do believe I share your sympathies. Oh, the ocean rolls so lovely. Chapter 7, A Violet Psychofluid At the close of my story, we all went to sleep for a few fitful hours. In the dim light of dawn, Ev and I made our way to a cluster of huts about three-quarters of a mile away, on the shore of the Agara Paraná, above the Choro. We knew that we Toto, coming down the river to the mission to deliver their children to school, would stay in those normally empty houses. Our hope was to buy some eggs, papayas, or squash to supplement our diet of brown rice, yucca, and plantinos. Instead, we found only a small group of people, and the only item for sale was a grapefruit-sized, green, heart-shaped fruit filled with slimy, vaguely sweet seeds awash in a light purple syrup. I do not know even today what that fruit was. I have described it to botanist acquaintances and have never heard a satisfactory identification. And I have yet to encounter these fruits again. They were very inexpensive, and since we had come with the expectation of buying something, we spent fifteen pesos and got nearly fifty pounds of this curious food. Even though I had been up most of the night plying the hallucinogenic ocean of mind, I felt fit and full of vitality. I hoisted a bulging costal, our entire by, and set off back toward the mission at a brisk pace. I enjoyed this chore. The costal seemed light, almost a pleasure to carry along. Without pause even to rest for a moment, Ev and I returned to the mission and to Vanessa and Dave's riverside residence for our breakfast in common. When we left our own hut and went in search of food, Dennis had been deeply asleep but now he was up and had apparently gone immediately to awaken Vanessa and describe to her his experiences of a few hours previous, experiences whose recollection was being excitedly told as we arrived at the house and set down the load. Throughout the making of breakfast, the events of the last evening were rediscussed and dissected. Vanessa and Dave were unmoved by Dennis's excited assertion that some extremely peculiar energy field had been tapped into and verified. At the end of breakfast, I suggested to Dennis that rather than arguing with people about the nature of the experience, he should go off by himself and write down all that he thought about the strange sound that he had made. He accepted this idea and made his way back up the hill to the Knoll House to be alone. And there he wrote, 28 February, 28 February 1971. 1971. I, I approached these pages with a peculiar sense of urgency, as a man might who had confronted an inexplicable phenomenon of some impossible creation of dreams or unaccountable natural principle. The task facing such a man would be a very subtle one, that is, to describe the phenomenon as accurately as possible. My task is compounded by the fact that the phenomenon I must try to describe 
has itself to do with the very tools of description, i.e. language. This rather peculiar statement will begin to make more sense as we explore the concept more fully. Before going further, something tells me it is necessary to consider who I am. Twenty-four hours ago, I thought I knew. Now, this has become the most perplexing question I have ever been confronted with. The questions leading from it will provide the answers that will allow us to understand and use the phenomenon which is so difficult to describe. This may be the last characters of crude language that I will ever apply to the description of anything, since the phenomenon begins at the edge of language where the concept forming faculty gropes but finds no words, I must be careful to avoid not distinguishing between mere language, symbol, metaphor, and the reality I'm attempting to apply it to. Since any phenomenon is, to a point, describable in empirical terms, so too with this one. It has to do with controlling one's body chemistry in such a way as to produce very specific vocal and audio phenomena. The state becomes possible when highly biodynamic vegetable alkaloids specifically tryptamines and MAO inhibitors are introduced into the body under very carefully regulated parameters. This phenomenon is apparently possible in the presence of tryptamines alone, though MAO inhibition definitely helps to trigger it by facilitating tryptamine absorption. The phenomenon has now been triggered by two people within our immediate group. Terence has been experimenting with vocal phenomena under the influence of DMT for some years now. Until last night, when I triggered and experienced the sound wave for a few brief seconds under the influence of 19 Stropharia mushrooms, Terence was the only person I knew who claimed ability to perform this sound. But last night, after ingesting the mushrooms, we lay waiting in our hammocks. The heavy, poisoned feeling that commonly passes briefly over the limbs at the beginning of the Stropharia visions had by this time passed completely. It had given way, in me at least, to a warm suffusion of contentment and good feeling that actually seemed to burn away somewhere inside of me. Such feelings I have had before, both on mushrooms and just after DMT flashes. Then we began to discuss people far away and how we might attempt to contact them fourth dimensionally. Not such a strange rap for us. But it was definitely at some point in time near to that conversation that I first heard the sound immeasurably distant and faint in the region between the ears not outside but definitely incredibly there perfectly distinct on the absolute edge of audio perception a sound almost like a signal or very very faint transmissions of radio buzzing from somewhere something like tingling chimes at first but gradually becoming amplified into a snapping popping gurgling crackling electrical sound I try to imitate these noises with my vocal cords, just experimenting with a kind of humming, buzzing vocal sound made deep in the throat. Suddenly it was as if the sound of my voice locked into each other and the sound was my voice, but coming out of me in such a way that no human voice could possibly distort itself the way mine was doing. The sound was suddenly much intensified in energy and was like the sound of a giant insect. While Dennis wrote, the rest of us swam indolently in the river and washed our laundry under a clear, infinitely blue and empty Amazonian sky. The background drone of the cicadas would occasionally rise in a coherent wave and sweep over the warm and shining surface of the gently drifting Igaraparana, falling like electricity across the land in the heat of the equatorial day. Late that afternoon, Dennis came back down to the edge of the river looking for me. He found me washing out my tennis shoes on a large flat rock that the shifting height of the river had conveniently exposed just a foot or two above the water line. Doubtless, whenever it was so exposed, it served as the favorite local laundry spot. Magic spot. It's magic at that moment, still fourteen days into the future. But there we sat and talked. It had been about 16 hours since the episode with the strange sound during the trip of the evening before. Dennis said that the writing exercise had been very useful. Great, and so what have you come up with? I'm not sure. I'm very excited. But whatever it is that is the cause of my excitement is also developing ideas in my mind nearly faster than I can write them down. 
ideas. What sort of ideas? Ideas about how we can use this effect or this stuff or whatever it is. My intuition is that it is related to the psychofluids that Harner reported and to what happened to you in Bodhana. Remember how Harner implied that Ayahuascaros vomited a magical substance that was the basis of their ability to divine? This is like that, some sort of translinguistic stuff made with a voice. Matter that is hyperdimensional and therefore translinguistic. Is that what you mean? Whatever that means. But something like that, I guess. Gad! Why not? I mean, it's pretty nuts. But no more nuts than the shamanic magic that we came here looking into. No, I suppose not. But here's the thing. If there is something weird going on, then we should observe it and see what it is and try to reduce it to some coherent framework. Granted, we don't know what it is that we are dealing with, but on the other hand, we know that we came here to investigate shamanic magic generally. So now we have to go to work on this effect, or whatever it is, and just hope that we know what we're doing and have enough data to crack it. We are too isolated to do anything else, and to ignore it might be to squander a golden opportunity. Yes, you're right. So here we are, very much on the brink of deep water. We are having something like beginner's luck, you know, finding the others so accessible. The mushroom is doing this, or the mushroom and the yahe smoking. It is so hard to be sure. So many variables. There's a lot of synchronistic activity, too. Right. I feel on the brink of something tremendous. We must just observe our active fantasy closely and try to ride herd on what is developing. The good old Jungian method, that's all. Yes, ideally all of this could be distilled down to the point where some sort of test of the validity of the effect could somehow be set up. We talked at length there by the river's edge, ranging over the options and the possibilities. He was insistent in linking my experiences in Nepal with a very strange phenomenon occurring in Hivaro shamanism. The people take Yahe, and they and other people who have taken Yahe, but no one else, can see a violet fluid. It is described as violet or deep blue, and it bubbles and is like a liquid. One vomits it. When one vomits from taking Yahe, this purple goo comes out of one's body. It can not only be vomited or regurgitated, but it forms on the surface of the skin like sweat. The Hivero do much of their magic with this peculiar stuff. They say that they spread it out on the ground in front of them, and that one can look at this material and see other times and other places. By their reports, it is made out of something completely transnormal. It is made out of space-time, or it is made out of mind, or it is pure hallucination objectively expressed, but always keeping itself within the confines of a liquid. There is an instance in the teaching of Don Juan where the entity Mescalito holds up his hand and Castaneda sees his whole past, a past incident in his life, in this hand. Supposedly, if this phenomenon has an empirical validity, what is happening is a very thin film of this projective transdimensional goo is there, and when you look at it, it is like perfect feedback. It is a mirror not of your physical reflection, but of who you are. All this lies in the realm of speculation, of course. Does this stuff exist, or is it just a hallucination? Who can believe in a thing like that? Dennis felt strongly that it was connected with sounds. One could either stabilize the stuff or cause it to appear by doing something with one's voice. It was a strange idea, because one could extrapolate it infinitely, what this stuff could be, that if one made it in three dimensions, then it would be anything, this ectoplasmic bubbling mind goo in the fourth dimension. It seemed possible to suppose that one might pierce the other dimension and have this stuff come boiling out. He talked a lot about it. We cut down the mushroom intake, except that I kept nibbling it. I was ecstatic. 
I thought his ideas were wonderful. I felt it was yet another idea from the tryptamine ocean that had floated up into our nets. What could we do with it? some eight years later, it is hard to be sure, having learned so much since, just what we did believe, just what level of sophistication we did have. Our mood was one of delight and light, the several mushroom experiences in that remote and beautiful place having led to a gently swelling euphoria. It was a very happy time. We were excited with the prospect of actually grappling under near-perfect conditions with the secret, as we called it then, meaning the spectrum of effects encountered in tryptamine-induced ecstasy. That had been the compass of our quest, the rose-window topologies of the galactarian beehives of the dimethyl tryptamine flash. We were not unused to the idea of the other, but we had only glimpsed it in brief flashes and in its manifestation as the Lux Natura. Everyone in our small expedition felt, I think, the sense of something opening around us, of the suspension of time as we turned and turned in a widening green world that was strangely and almost erotically alive all around us for thousands of miles. The jungle as mind, the world hanging in space as mind, images of order and sentient organization crowding in on all sides, how small we were, knowing little yet fiercely proud of what we knew, and feeling ourselves somehow the representatives of humanity, meeting something strange and other, something at the edge of human experience since the very beginning. A proud and eerie grandeur seemed mixed with our enterprise as those first days at La Chirera went by. The next day, the first of March, passed uneventfully. Dennis worked on his journal, I collected insects, and Vanessa photographed around the mission. At evening we were all gathered again at the edge of the knoll where our small lodging stood. In silent communion with each other in the river, Ev and I sat looking out over the lake. It was Ev who noticed it first. The lake beneath the choro was flecked with foam generated by the rush of the water through the narrow channel at the upper end of the lake. The floating foam on the brown water served to mark the currents of the river, their many flows and counterflows. It was at this that Ev had exclaimed, for after minutes of watching the water flow by, suddenly a change had stolen over the moving marbled surface of the further side of the river, it seemed to have stopped. Just that, just simply to have stopped moving. The surface appeared frozen, yet the near half of the river was seen to continue as before. Dennis and Vanessa were called out of the hut and they agreed that the effect was remarkable. I wandered away from a discussion of the time of day, the light conditions, optical illusions, and all the rest. I seemed to have no heart for these arguments. Each time they broke out, I found myself with some deep inner assurance that the situation was moving forward just as it should and that everyone was playing a part and doing it very well. This mood of calm resignation was something new to me, perhaps enhanced by the mushroom, but developed during the month in Colombia preceding our trek into the jungle. As I walked, I looked for a place to sit down, Dennis had offered me his journal entry for that day to read. 1 March, 1971. 
One last March, night, I again triggered the phenomenon last after night, having eaten I one mushroom and smoking grass. It mushroom, was almost identical to the first experience, almost a lifting, the pulsing experience. wave of a local buzzing, pulsing wave growing, of local buzzing, growing loud quickly, growing loud very quickly and picking up shock energy as it did though so. I could have the though I could have prolonged the sound beyond a brief burst, 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 I, did burst I did not because of the energy. I am certain that soon it will become possible to trigger the sound completely without tryptamines or other drugs. It is becoming easier to plug in on each time, and I feel now that it is accessible at any time. It is clearly a learned activity that tryptamines can initiate and trigger, but it can happen without tryptamines once it is understood and mastered. We have thus far been able to establish the existence of peculiar vocal phenomena in two individuals subject to similar experimental controls. We must now attempt to understand what it is that the phenomenon could be. We must perform experiments with the sound and from our results develop theories to understand the processes at work. Terence has experimented with these sounds far more than anyone else, and I am the only other one that I know of, and he has discovered some interesting things. The DMT-initiated state, which allows prolonged bursts of this vocal energy, he describes as being one of seeing the levels of sound become more dense as they finally materialize into small, gnome-like, machine-like creatures made of a material like obsidian froth, which pours from the body, mouth, and sex organs as long as the sound continues. It is effervescent, phosphorescent, and indescribable. Here is where the linguistic metaphors become useless, for what the material actually is, is super-linguistic matter. It is a language, but not made of words, a, a language which becomes the thing it describes. The it, describes. It, is it is a more perfect archetypal, archetypal logos. logos. We are convinced, we are convinced that, through that through experimentation with these vocal phenomena, with and without the aid of drugs, it will be possible, and to, will be possible to understand to and use any reality. translinguistic matter or to say to anything in this voice is to cause that for to, to say happen. Anything in this voice Such a rash statement would be outlandish if it were not for our long and tedious speculations on the matter. Such a rash statement would be outlandish the chemistry of mind, the metabolism of tribulation, the nature of thought, of consciousness, consciousness history, of magic, shamanism, quantum and relativistic physics, metamorphosis and insects, alchemical processes, etc., together with the intuitive understanding of a-causal events that we are deriving from the stropharia, allows us to venture a not entirely wild guess as to what the sound which takes form may be. Hallucinogens, by affecting the neural matrix, can produce changes in consciousness in the temporal dimension. Clearly, consciousness can work changes in three dimensions as well. On tryptamines, it is possible, under special conditions, to hear and vocalize a sound that turns through a higher dimensional manifold and condenses as translinguistic matter, that is, matter reduplicated upon itself through time, much as a hologram is reduplicated through space. The substance whose appearance the sounds initiate is tryptamine metabolized by mind through a higher spatial dimension. It is a hyperdimensional molecule carrying its trip on the outside of itself in this world. The hyperdimensional nature of this material is such that it is all material, concepts, events, words, people, and ideas homogenized into one thing via the higher dimensional alchemy of mind. Many questions occur concerning the phenomenology of this temporal hologram as fluid matrix. We speculate it is hyperdimensionally metabolized tryptamine, an alchemical phenomenon which is a correct union of tryptamine, a compound nearly ubiquitous in organic nature, with vocally produced sound mediated by mind. It is the mind that directs this process and that direction consists of a harmonic attunement to an interiorized audio-linguistic phenomenon, which may be an electron-spin resonance tone of the psilocybin molecule. When this tone is locked in on, a process which consists of vocally imitating the interior tone to perfection, the hyperdimensional tryptamine is produced. 
Is this substance mental, as an idea is mental? Is it as real as an ordinary liquid, like water? Harner, in Harner insisted that Hivaro shamans, under the influence of MAO inhibiting, tryptamines plus Banisteriopsis copy infusions, produce a fluorescent liquid by means of which they accomplish all their magic. Though invisible to ordinary perception, this fluid is said to be visible to anyone who has ingested the brew. Yahe is frequently associated with violet auras and deep blue hallucinations. This may indicate a thermal plasma, perhaps only visible in the UV spectrum. If this phenomenon is found to fall into the category mental indicated above, it would function as described, but with the limitation of not being tangential to ordinary space-time. It will still represent perfected understanding of the hyperdimension Young named is the collective the unconscious. Thermal plasma, perhaps only visible in the ultraviolet spectrum. If this phenomenon is found to fall into the category mental and indicated above, functioning as described, but with limitations of not being tangential to ordinary space time, it will still represent perfected understanding of the hyperdimension Jung named the collective unconscious. Looking back from a vantage point of nearly eight years on these notes makes them appear naive. At the time when I first read them, I doubted what I read, since it seemed to go against the grain of common sense, and at that time I could not really understand them. Today, after years of education pushed toward understanding the events at La Chirera, these ideas seem as magically near and yet as far as they did then. We had a theory, and we had experiences, and we linked them through an experiment that is preposterous unless there is some seed of operational truth in the bizarre ideas born in that period. The years pass and the theories deepen. What, what you, you call, call time, time is, is actually, actually man, man, the oracular voice of the mushroom ventured recently to tell me. So it is that years later I still pursue and still do not understand the angelic glossolalia that psilocybin makes possible for the thinking mind and the singing voice. Is it, I now wonder, an ur language of emotions that originates in that unexplored part of the brain that is a reflection of Broca's area, but which is on the other non-dominant side of the brain? Could there be a language so intense and so emotional that no cultural conventions of meaning would be necessary to understand? A language of emotion so intense that though it would be conveyed by vocal sound, its richness would be so great that it would be the equivalent of a telepathic ray? Today I think so, and with the aid of psilocybin I labor carefully to perfect it. I believe that it is a subroutine of the human organism, an ancient shamanic art of using sound to convey incredible emotion, emotion so intense that its power is truly magical. Perhaps these ideas are no more than Dennis were then concerning the meaning of the powers of psilocybin. What unites the two perceptions is the sense of a nearby mystery of tremendous importance. Elusive as the mystery has been, that sense of its imminence has never left my experience. Mysteries are not unsolved problems. They are things which in their very nature are mysterious. I would have not believed such a thing possible had I not been shown. Later that same evening, Ev, Dennis, and I smoked a joint of Santa Marta gold before turning in. It was a calm, perfectly clear night when we sat down and began our ritual. Ev commented on the clarity of the night, and we all stared together for a moment out into the galaxy, the night awash with millions of stars. We smoked in awed silence. Perhaps five minutes went by, each of the three of us lost in our own ideas. The reverie ended with Dennis's exclamation. Look, look how quickly the air conditions have changed. Now there is a ground fog just springing up. 